how many of you know what Initiative 502 is? Please raise your hands. Don't sweat it if you don't. It's our state's legalization measure that passed in 2012, and it legalizes cannabis for adults 21 and up. Now, how many of you voted for 502? Get them up. Okay. And not to insult anyone's intelligence, but how many of you know that marijuana is still federally illegal? Right? And more importantly, and more to the point, how many of you think it shouldn't be? That is not a surprise. Thank you for that. My name is Hillary Bricken. I'm a lawyer from Seattle, and all I do all day, every day, is help entrepreneurs navigate the cannabis industry here in the Pacific Northwest and outside the region in different states. And while you might think it is tremendously sexy to do nothing but talk pot 24-7, I assure you it does get old at some point, but not today. Because today, we talk about the power and polarity, the best of both worlds, namely, can we have the repeal of federal marijuana prohibition without installing big marijuana in its place? And more importantly, is state legal marijuana creating big marijuana? I ask that you keep those two questions in the forefront of your minds as I go through my talk. Now, in order to get to the answer to those questions, I have to give you a little bit of a backdrop of what's happened between the states and the feds over the years. This is a map behind me of the 23 plus states that have some form of legal marijuana reform on the books. This slide also contains the states that this year will have ballot initiatives to legalize cannabis for adults. Now, you might be thinking, how can the states opt out of federal marijuana prohibition? How is this even possible? And it really hinges on a few simple principles, the main one of which is that none of these states and their laws require anybody to actually violate federal law. It is purely voluntary. And you too, out of your own volition, in some of these states could start a cannabis business taking the risk every day that the federal government would not come in and enforce the law against you. Now, the feds have not been entirely silent on the issue over the years. Since 2009, they've issued a series of enforcement memoranda telling U.S. attorneys how to apply federal law in states that have state legal marijuana. The most important, most relevant memo issued in 2013 by then acting Deputy U.S. Attorney General James M. Cole. And that memo has specific ramifications, and it's very important to this topic of big marijuana because it says a few things that are relevant. The first one of which is that the federal government will not waste money or manpower going into federal court trying to sue the states to overturn their legal marijuana regimes. The second one is that finally the federal government has articulated eight enforcement priorities that it will make its goals in states with legal marijuana, and those range from not dealing drugs to kids, not diverting product out of state and out of the country, and finally not dealing with the drug cartels or other internationally illegal enterprises. At the same time, what this memo says in between the lines is that to a certain extent, the federal government is gonna tolerate these democratic experiments, but if and only if the states have robust enough regulation to govern and control commercial cannabis activity. And if the states don't, the federal government will not remain at bay. They will come in with the full power of the Constitution behind them, and they will enforce laws accordingly in these states. Now, what has robust regulation given us? Because it is key, right? It is key to state legalization, its success. It is also key to the building up and building out of big marijuana, which is a total irony. But this is pretty much what we're used to, right? These iconic images that we know and love. I know myself, I'm a huge Big Lebowski fan. And while the dude abides, I do not think the dude was ready or prepared for the 21st century of cannabis under a robust regulatory regime. So what has robust regulation given us? Okay, now between these two slides, it may surprise you, these are the products that are currently in Washington's marijuana marketplace. You can see, this is no longer your daddy's grass, right? When we talk about oils, topicals, tinctures, lotions, etc., we are now talking about the majority of products in the marijuana marketplace. And as you can see, they're heavily packaged, heavily labeled, there's more transparency than ever, and there's more corporate accountability than ever for the people who make these things. So if anything, robust regulation has given us products that are probably more diverse, more dynamic, certainly safer, unfortunately probably more expensive, but ultimately of a better quality in some respects. Robust regulation has also given us barriers to entry. So much so that at this point, only a certain type of entrepreneur with a certain amount of money is really participating on a really easy level. Some examples of those barriers to entry are traceability requirements, product tracking requirements, packaging and labeling requirements, land use buffer, landlord requirements. We have financial requirements and criminal background checks. If anybody in here is a convicted felon, don't even waste your time applying to own or operate one of these businesses in most of these states because you will never be eligible to do so. Now, what does this mean? How does this culminate in the industry? What it means is that right now, only the strong are surviving. And who are the strong? 
really two groups, those who are well capitalized and those with deep and vast political connections in order to exert influence. And that begs the question, because now, on the, both the state and the federal and even the local level, we have pot packs, and God forbid we actually have pot lobbyists. Yes, that is a job now. <laughs> so again, it begs the question, is state legal marijuana as a result of robust regulation creating big marijuana? And I posit to you that the answer is yes. So who is big marijuana, right? Who do you run from? Who do you criticize? Where do you invest your money? What is a safe bet in this extremely volatile industry? In my opinion, it's really four main groups, all of which in some way are trying to control and dominate the industry by making it more commercial and industrial than ever. These are no longer people growing weed in their backyard or in their mom's basement. The four groups are states with monopolies that promote anti-competitive behavior, most of the businesses in the recreational cannabis states, ancillary businesses that support the industry but don't touch the product or the plant, and finally, my personal favorite, celebrity pot and brands and endorsements. So let's talk about each one in turn. <laughs> States with monopolies that promote anti-competitive behavior, unfortunately, from my perspective, are becoming the norm. And by legislative design and on purpose, what is happening is that these states really only want a certain kind of business person participating in their jurisdictions. In all of the states behind me, which I consider to be the repeat offenders, what's been available and what's been proposed, very few number of licenses that are typically vertically integrated, meaning you have to cultivate, process, and distribute it yourself, where you absolutely control the price and you exclusively control who can access the product. Florida is a very good example. In this state, by legislative action, what was available? Five licenses in the entire state to control the five regions of Florida. And in order to even get a license, you had to have been a plant nursery in existence in the state for no less than 30 years. <laughs> I know, I know. And I'm from Florida, people. I mean, this is terrible. Um, at the same time, though, you can see this is a very small group of people to wield a tremendous amount of control over a really big state and a really popular industry. Now, what's happening in the recreational marijuana states oftentimes, really the incentive is to put profit before people because robust regulation is creating a huge bottom line. It is more expensive than ever to run one of these businesses. And in order to survive, you not only want to make your investment back, but you want to be profitable in order to comply with the regulations. The other thing is that there's a tremendous amount of competition. There is a huge amount of saturation. So you have every motivation to develop routine customers with regular habits to ensure survival. We also know that between Colorado and Washington, there's huge demand for the product. I mean, that's a no-brainer. In 2014 and 2015, in both states between those years, they did about 70 million in tax revenue, which you're probably thinking, that's not that big of a deal. But in Colorado, that outpaced alcohol, which only did 42 million, and here in Washington, even though we only collected 70 million, we sold over $257 million of pot. So super high demand being filled by mostly money-incentivized companies who are trying to survive and be highly competitive. Now, moving on to ancillary businesses, these guys are special. They're not necessarily violating federal law, which means they're not subject to robust regulation, and they have way less federal oversight than, let's say, a marijuana business does. These guys, as a result, can do things, and they're more liberal than cannabis businesses are. For example, they can get a bank account, right? Because of federal law, banks will not launder money on behalf of illegal entities. So these guys can get a bank account, and they can do more than that. They can get funding, institutional investors. They can get a bank loan. They can develop highbrow branding that they can protect to the full extent of federal law. Very different than a cannabis business. Now, these four businesses that I have behind me are at the intersection of where marijuana meets technology, okay? Hi there is considered the tinder of cannabis. So if you want a hot pot date, feel free to swipe right on hi there. Then we have Mass Roots, which is really the Instagram of marijuana. If you've got big buds and a Polaroid, that's where you would go. Weed Maps is like the Yelp of cannabis. If you have a favorite or least favorite dispensary, that's where you would go to review it. And finally, Leafly, which is really the equivalent of the WebMD of the pot world. And each of those tiles behind me, they represent a strain. And they will tell you not only what they do to you, but where you can find it and how much it costs. Now, interestingly about Leafly, they are owned by a joint venture firm here in Washington State, and they were able to secure a multi-million dollar bid from Peter Thiel's Founders Fund. Peter Thiel, being the founder of PayPal and one of the first outside investors in Facebook, whose personal mantra has been, monopolies are best for business. So I will let you draw your own conclusions from that. Finally, on to celebrity pop brands and endorsements. <laughs> Behind me, this kind of effect 
works just like any other commodity. For example, if you were a basketball player and you wanted to up your game, you might buy those shoes that LeBron or Steph Curry is wearing in order to do that. And it's no different with pot. If you want to be like these celebrities, have their lifestyle, maybe have some of their success, you're going to smoke what they smoke and use what they use. And clearly, we have some of the usual suspects that are already in the game. I have behind me Tommy Chong, whose main marquee strain is Chong Star. Then there's Leafs by Snoop, which is supposedly a medical marijuana brand whose trade slogan is Medicate, Elevate, and Lift It Up. <laughs> Then we have Marley Natural, my personal favorite. And ironically, Marley Natural, maybe not so ironically, is actually owned by the same joint venture firm that owns Leafly. And they are the world's first self proclaimed worldwide marijuana brand. And finally, we have Willie's Reserve for you, Willie Nelson fans. And if you're a music lover, cannabis connoisseur, Willie tells you about his pot, this is legendary. Now, in order for you to experience firsthand this celebrity pot epidemic, if that's how you want to see it, I would like you to watch this commercial that recently dropped from Marley Natural. In Bob Marley's vision for a better world, one united by love, respect, and social justice, he advocates for the positive power of the earth. To liberate our creativity, to encourage our reflection, and as the healing of the nation. Inspired by his deep respect for nature, for its power to awaken our well being, we embark on a new chapter of his legacy. To realize more fully in the world the many benefits of cannabis for the mind, body, and spirit. Make way for the positive day. Now, if the ghost of Bob Marley can't sell you the herb, I don't know what's wrong with you, right? <laughs> and that is the point. Because what I heard a lot about in that commercial was how cannabis can reveal you to yourself. It has reinvention qualities. I heard a lot about social justice, healing, love, and respect. And I heard even more about Bob Marley's legacy and lifestyle. But what I didn't hear about were side effects, drug interactions, the potential for addiction, if any. I heard nothing about science and data, and I'm pretty sure that that was by design. So what has the opposition to legalization, what have they said about this concept of big marijuana? Well, they have locked into it hook, line, and sinker. These two ads ran about a week apart in the New York Times, no less, okay? That's the level at which we're operating now. The one on the left was run by Leafly, and the one on the right was run by a prohibitionist group called grassisnotgreener.com. Now, what Leafly is trying to do, they're trying to use a play on words from the drug war rhetoric of the 80s and the 90s, just say no. And what Leafly wants you to know is that functioning adults that contribute to society can use cannabis in their everyday lives and the sky will not fall. Here we have two seemingly normal people, one exercising, one presumably going to or coming from work, and they're both using cannabis to treat their medical issues in their daily life. The important takeaway is that they are not serial killers, they are not psychopaths, and more importantly, they are not stoners. That is the message from Leafly. Now, on the right, the opposition is playing a completely different game. What they are trying to tell you is that the perception of the cannabis industry on its face is that it is perfectly harmless. But the reality is that the people behind legalization that are pushing for it, they care about nothing but anything but profits, right? And we have the boardroom and the power suit to prove it. And the main message is that the flower child of the past has been replaced by the Wall Street power broker of today and that the only thing that matters is profit, everything else be damned. And in this ad specifically, they compared the industry to the big tobacco industry. And the prohibitionists think that this is a super persuasive conversation to have, that most Americans haven't even thought about it, and that it is a huge deterrent, if not the deterrent, to legalization. Now, locally in Washington state, our Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board, which oversees our entire marijuana program, they are dealing with a big marijuana issue. Right now, if you want to invest in, gift money to, or lend money to any of these cannabis businesses, you have to have six months of residency, which has kept the industry a little cottage for a little bit longer. 
Well, because the businesses are trying to comply with robust regulation, that requires cash flow. So they want money from outside investors, namely out of state and maybe even from overseas. In the long run, that's probably a good thing. We want them to have this money because we want them to survive, to show the federal government that a taxation and regulation model is superior to prohibition. Now, at the same time, I think we should be a little worried about this money coming in where there's probably not gonna be a lot of connectivity with our communities, where they may not care about or be aware of the communal impact, the societal cost of the expansion of these businesses, how it affects our youth and our relationships with each other. And the Liquor Board is constantly weighing these issues of corporate versus cottage. Notably, they have not adopted any outside investment rule yet, but they are considering it. Finally, on the national level, the states hold all the cards. They are in absolute control, and they are and will be the arbiters of the fate of big marijuana. Congress has been willfully ignorant on the issue, despite the fact that for the first time in history, more than half of Americans want legalization of marijuana, and the Department of Justice has opted to stand down in the face of robust regulation. In addition, this is not the state's first rodeo, right? They've done this before. They did it with alcohol with its prohibition and repeal. We're just like today with cannabis. Differing and varying state models of taxing and regulating alcohol ultimately culminated in the repeal of federal alcohol prohibition. And that really is amazing. This is how our democracy is supposed to work. This is how we test the separation of powers, okay? This is how the states are supposed to operate in relationship to the federal government. But again, it is a little troubling because just like those in federal power, our state and local lawmakers, they too are susceptible to the charms of big business. And why is that the case? Because big business has sufficient skin in the game. They have the money, the manpower, and the resources to meet and exceed robust regulation, to surmount barriers to entry, to contribute handily and readily to campaign funds and elections, to control and influence the laws and regulations that govern their business, and probably most importantly, to drive up and capture more tax revenue as a result of capturing a bigger market share. So when we talk about the best of both worlds, I am not sure that we can even get to the repeal of federal marijuana prohibition without some kind of partnership with big marijuana. Because quickly what's happening is that in these states with robust regulation, to appease the federal government, the only entities oftentimes that are even capable of participating or eligible to participate are the big ones. And I don't know about you, but while I much prefer the Rasta lifestyle and dreadlocks to let's say cowboy boots and saddle burn, I think at this point, we all need to be asking ourselves what we should be doing as a community and what the industry should be doing to make sure that Marley country does not become Marlboro country. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and your time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.